the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity. Uh, and yet, at the same time that I say that, I also can imagine that this might be one of the most dreaded Sundays for preachers <laughs> because we come up against this great mystery of God, the one God in three divine persons. And so one of the things that uh, priests and deacons have told me is that this is, a, this is a tough Sunday to preach, especially since when you look at the actual readings that are chosen for Trinity Sunday, it's not always at first immediately apparent why these readings were selected and how to draw out the teaching of the church on the Trinity from these particular readings. So in this video, what I'm going to try to do is especially give some help to anyone out there who's having to preach on the mystery of the Trinity, because it is daunting, uh, because this is a great mystery. I want to begin our reflection on this Sunday, first, not with the readings themselves, but with a paragraph from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a beautiful section on the Trinity in the Catechism, which gives you a kind of summary of the Church's teaching on this mystery. It's paragraphs 232 to 260. Um, and there's one paragraph in particular that stands out for me. And it is Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 234. And this is what it says about the mystery of the Trinity. Quote, The mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is, therefore, the source of all the other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith." End quote. Now, that is a really strong statement. I know before I started to study theology, if you'd have asked me, what is the central mystery of the Christian faith, I probably would have said, well, it's uh, the Eucharist, you know, the source and summit of the Christian life. Or maybe I would have said, it's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Or maybe even his atonement on the cross or something like that. Uh, but that's not what the church teaches. The church teaches that the Trinity is the central mystery, that the mystery of God in himself, one God, three persons, is the central mystery of the Christian faith. And yet, for many of us, when we come up against the Trinity, we don't know what to do with it, right? Um, I mean, some, for some people, they almost treat it as if it's a kind of like a math problem, like one times one times one equals one. Or you hear different analogies used, like the clover or whatever, these analogies that actually can be sometimes misleading, trying to explain the mystery of the Trinity. And yet the Catechism is right here, and you can see this even if you just look at our life, our devotional life as Catholics. Think about it for a second. The beginning of our life as a Christian is us being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? And every time we enter a church, we dip our fingers into the water and we make the sign, we call it the sign of the cross, but it's also the sign of the Trinity, right? It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So even in those two moments, baptism and the sign of the cross, these two most fundamental elements of Christian devotion tell us that Christianity isn't just about the cross. It's about the Trinity, because the Trinity is the mystery of who God is in himself. The cross is the mystery of what he's done for us, but the Trinity is the mystery of who he is. And so, uh, what I want to do is look at the readings for this Sunday with that focus in mind, the centrality of the mystery of the Trinity, and see if we can unpack them in that light. So, what I want to do today is a little different. Instead of beginning with the Gospel, I want to start with the Old Testament reading. So let's go back to uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 34, is the reading for this Sunday. This is the famous story of the Lord appearing to Moses on Mount Sinai after the destruction of the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. So you recall Moses breaks the tablets when he, tablets when he finds the Israelites committing idolatry, and then he has to go back up the mountain in order to get a new set. And so in that context, in Exodus 34, verse, verse 4, we read these words. So Moses cut two tables of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now pause there. Whenever you see those Hebrew word, I mean, whenever you see the English word Lord in all caps, it's the sacred divine name, Y-H-W-H. -H. 
the, what's called the Tetragrammaton, those four holy letters that the Jewish people didn't actually pronounce. We're not quite sure even how it's pronounced, but it's the name of the Lord, the personal name of the God of Israel. And it says, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And Moses made haste to bow his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us, although it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thy inheritance. All right, so pause there. You can understand why someone trying to preach this might be wondering, what does this have to do with the Trinity, right? I mean, it's not clearly a reference to the Trinity. If you just look at the literal sense of the text in its context, this is an account of Moses meeting God on Mount Sinai in order to get two tablets, two new tablets of the Ten Commandments. So what does that have to do with the Trinity? Well, um, if you read the text according to its spiritual sense, you're going to see something a little different. In other words, one of the things that the ancient church fathers knew is that although the Most Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity, was not fully revealed until Pentecost, God allowed signs and shadows and kind of like hints of the mystery of the Trinity to be slowly revealed over the course of time in the Old Testament. And when we go back and we look at them through the light of the New Testament, we can see some clues and some signs to the mystery of the Trinity in these passages of the Old Testament. So in this case, there are two key signs here. First and foremost, notice there in verse 5, it says, the Lord descended in the cloud. Okay. Now, if you look at Scripture from beginning to end, from Old Testament to New, whenever you see God coming in the cloud, whenever you see the cloud, this is always a symbol or an image for the Spirit of God. Right? And you'll see this in the New Testament on multiple occasions, like in the Feast of the Transfiguration. When God comes down upon the mountain, the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, the Son is present, and His presence comes upon Jesus and the disciples in a cloud. They're overshadowed by a cloud. And so that cloud there is a mystery of the Holy Spirit. So you'll see the connection between the cloud over and over again. The Catechism actually says this in paragraph 697, that the cloud is a symbol for the Spirit. Right? Secondly, and this is even more interesting, when you see the Lord coming, notice what happens here. It says the Lord stood with Moses there. Now, I think most of us, when we see the Lord in the Old Testament, not without good reason, we just assume that means God the Father, right? Like so. Uh, the, the, the Lord is the name of the Father. But remember, in the New Testament, Lord is one of the principal titles for Jesus, for the Son, right? So in ancient Christian tradition, this is going all the way back to the church fathers, like Justin Martyr, for example, or Irenaeus. Whenever they saw appearances of God, whenever the Lord would come down, especially if he took the, uh, like appeared as a man, like the three men who come to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 19. Whenever those occurrences would happen, the ancient church fathers always said that that actually was the Son, in a sense, coming to humanity to speak to them, to appear to them, not in an incarnate way, but in a kind of way that prefigured what would ultimately happen in the incarnation. So what do we have here? The cloud symbolizes the Spirit, and the Lord is an image for the Son, or for the second person of the Trinity, the Word. And you don't have to take my word for this. You can actually, again, look at the Catechism. Because in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 707, it gives us a hint as to how to interpret these ancient appearances of God in the Old Testament. This is what the Catechism says, quote, Theophanies, manifestations of God, light up the way of the promise. From the patriarchs to Moses and from Joshua to the visions that inaugurated the missions of the great prophets. Christian tradition has always recognized that God's word allowed himself to be seen and heard in these theophanies, in which the cloud of the Holy Spirit both revealed him and concealed him in its shadow. Fascinating passage there in the Catechism. Notice what it's saying here. The Word, the second person of the Trinity, also known as the Son, who would eventually become incarnate as Jesus Christ, would appear in the Old Testament, often in and with the cloud, which was the Holy Spirit, both concealing and revealing the divine person. So what you have in the Old Testament is these two divine persons, the Word and the Spirit, the Son and the Spirit, acting together 
in the theophanies, in the revelations of God to patriarchs, to Moses, and to the prophets. So they are encountering the persons of the Trinity, but in such a way that they're still hidden and it's not fully revealed. So when the church picks a theophany for the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, it's reflecting that tradition of seeing these as a sign, as a shadow of the fullness of the mystery of the Trinity that will be revealed in the New Testament. And as the appearance, in a sense, of two of the persons of the Trinity, the Word and the Spirit, or the Son and the Spirit. All right. Before I move on, just a brief caveat, because I want to be clear on this. This is not to say that Jesus became incarnate in the Old Testament. Some people have made that error. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that God comes and reveals himself, the tri-personal God, the three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Son and the Spirit in a special way come into the world to reveal God to the prophets and the patriarchs.